Good morning, everybody. Oh, that's, that's, that's not great. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. That's much better. That's much better. I have a story to tell you guys, and then I need your help with a little participation, too. Yay. So this is the story and the news of Tabitha. They're going to learn a little bit about some of these things that, uh, that we're learning about today, too. So it might be good for the, the, the adults to listen, too, if they don't pick up what, what Pastor John has to say today. So Peter was staying in Lydda, near Joppa. He healed people and shared the good news of Jesus. Two men from Joppa ran up to Peter. Please come with us, they cried. Our friend Tabitha has died. Peter felt sad. Tabitha was a follower of Jesus. Her heart was big. She gave her time to sew tunics for people who needed clothes. Everyone knew who Tabitha, everyone knew Tabitha loved her. Everyone who knew Tabitha loved her. She was kind and helpful. Peter looked at the two men. Their eyes were filled with hope. Take me to your house, Peter said. Tabitha, Tabitha's home was filled with people. They cried out of sadness. God, why did you take Tabitha? We miss her. Who will make clothes for people in need? Peter stood beside Tabitha's body. A group of widows gathered round him. They cried and showed him the beautiful tunics Tabitha had sewn. Peter asked them to leave so that he could be alone. He knelt down and prayed to God. Then he stood up and whispered in Tabitha's ear, Tabitha, get up. Tabitha's eyes popped open. She saw Peter and smiled. Peter held out his hand and helped her up. Then the widows saw Tabitha. When the widows saw Tabitha, they exclaimed, Tabitha is alive! It's a miracle! God is so good! Tabitha's story was told all over Joppa. More and more people believed in the Lord. So Peter had to travel a pretty long way between these two cities. The time that it took, the, the miles between was probably between 10 or 15 miles, which might be about half of what's happening tomorrow. What's happening tomorrow here in Boston? The marathon. the marathon, right? So people had to get in shape to get from point A to point B. And Peter had to do a lot of the same thing. He probably had to walk about two, maybe four hours to get t to Tabitha. So this morning, I need all of you to show me how in shape you are to do God's work. So I need you to stand up. We're going to do three squats. I'll show you how to do a squat. All right. So sometimes you never know what God is going to have us do. So sometimes, this is a squat. That's probably not the best squat. Got my, got my good clothes on. So we're going to do three squats. Then I want you to run in place for three seconds. And I want you to do one push-up. Can we do that? OK. Here we go. Squats. Arms out. One, two, three. OK, run in place. One, two. Three, and push up. There we go. All right, sit back down. <laughs> so Peter had to be in great shape. And sometimes we have to be ready, prepared for what God calls us to do. So let's say a quick prayer, and then we're all going to go upstairs. Dear God, we are so thankful for this beautiful day. And may we be fit for the work that you have us do to proclaim your good news. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's head upstairs.
I spent the past few days in Kentuckic, New Hampshire. Anyone know if I'm saying that wrong? Kentuckic? Kentuckic. I spent the past few days in Kentuckic, New Hampshire. I was at a continuing education seminar that was being hosted at a Greek Orthodox retreat center in the woods. And one afternoon on a break, a group of us drove into town to see some of the local sites. There were just a few, a beautiful covered bridge, a picturesque little downtown area, and the Marklin Candle Company factory and store. The last one is really just for church nerds. Because at the Marklin Candle Company factory and store, Martin Marklin has been hand-making beeswax candles for churches ever since he dropped out of a Roman Catholic seminary about 20 years ago to marry his wife. He makes beeswax candles that are as small as little tapers like the ones that we burned at the Easter Vigil and the Epiphany service. And he also makes these big Paschal candles that are about that far around and can be six or seven feet tall. And they're designed to burn during worship for an entire year. They're marked with significant dates and celebrations that, that he expects they will burn this far by Christmas, this far by Epiphany. And he's been doing it for a while, and his candles are known for their accuracy. And Martin, Martin Marklin, likes to control the entire supply chain. So around the outside of his factory, the fields are full of beehives buzzing and swarming, making the wax that will become the candles for the church. When we ran into Martin, he was standing out in a field of bees in a simple shirt, khaki pants, with Birkenstock sandals over thick gray socks. He had none of the protective gear that I would typically associate with beekeeping, and despite his very warm invitation to come and look closely at one particular hive, I decided to, to stand back. He was not wearing the veil and the hood. He just had one of those steel smokers, and he wielded it with the practiced hand of a priest swinging incense. And as he was walking around the bees, checking on the health of the hives, he was quietly singing under his breath. I had to ask one of my Episcopalian friends what he was chanting, and she seemed shocked that I didn't know. It's the exultate, a eight or nine minute long chant that's usually sung at Easter the vigil of Easter, the Saturday night before Easter morning. And there is a part of that prayer that is chanted right at the moment when that enormous Paschal candle is lit for the very first time. I don't know the tune, but here are the words. A brand new six or seven foot tall candle lit for the very first time as the people sing, on this your night of grace, O holy God, accept this candle, a solemn offering, the work of bees and of your servants' hands an evening sacrifice of praise, this gift from your church. 
Now we know the praises of this pillar which glowing fire ignites for God's honor. A fire which, though into many flames divided, is never dimmed by the sharing of its light. For it is fed by melting wax, the work of mother bees who build a torch so precious. So this was the scene. Martin, the seminary dropout in socks and sandals, softly singing praises to his bees for the gift of their wax to the church's candles. We spent about an hour with him, and the whole time he talked with that sort of uh, hurried and beautiful excitement of a child about the bees and the wax and the candles. He was showing us the queen and how you could tell the difference between the drones and the workers. He was in the sweet spot of life. And I thought to myself that there could be no doubt that if God put bees on the earth to make wax and honey, God put Martin Marklin on earth to make candles. Have you ever known someone like that? Someone whose life hums with purpose, someone who seems at each moment to be doing precisely what God put them on earth to do. It, it only happens every once in a while. But it's really beautiful to see. I've been reading the Bible for quite some time, and I confess I've always missed this story. I've always missed Dorcas or Tabitha. Her story is so brief, and it falls in this section of the Gospel of Acts where the apostles have been running around the Mediterranean, raising the dead and healing the sick everywhere they go. And so Dorcas in Joppa must have just gotten lost in the white noise for me all these years when I was reading the book of Acts. But this week, her story and just her story is the assigned reading for churches all over the world. And when I was finally forced to slow down and read her story, it really made quite an impression on me, and particularly an impression because of one little detail. After Dorcas died, after Tabitha died, they washed and cared for her body, they tenderly laid her down, and they called for Peter, and when Peter arrived, the widows were waiting for him to show him all the garments that Dorcas had made during her lifetime. The subtext is this, Dorcas, a woman of great charity, had made garments for them, poor widows who had little other means of support. She had devoted her life to doing one simple thing and doing it really well, making clothes for the poor. And so when she died, the widows were all there to show Peter what they had left of her, the tunics that she had made for them while she was alive. Those tunics, they're simple garments, nothing ornate or special. They're the clothing of every day, but they had become for this community of widows like talismans, tokens of their memory of her, a little piece of what they had lost, of the woman who had died. And I want to be clear that I think raising someone from the dead is nothing to sneeze at, but there is another miracle here in the story that I want, to, I want to focus on. It's a smaller miracle, a more subtle miracle, a, a beautiful miracle that happens before Peter even shows up. Tabitha was devoted to good works and charity. 
in the simple thing that she did so well for so long, she touched so many lives that when she died, the community showed up with their arms full of clothing she had made to remember her. Because her charity had touched their lives so deeply, because her love had made such an impact on them, her story and her name became part of the Christian story and the Christian witness, and we still read it today. That smaller miracle is that a woman who sewed clothing really well and gave it away with great generosity gets her story told for thousands of years. I imagine that for most of her life, people probably hardly ever noticed her. Probably not any more than I noticed her the first dozen times I read the book of Acts. And yet she lived a life of such beauty by doing something simple so well for the love of her neighbors and for the sake of God that when she died, people remembered her. And she lived again, and she lived on. I had this story folded up on a little piece of paper in my pocket, which is what I do when I have to preach. I had this, fold, this story folded up, a little piece of paper in my pocket, while I was watching Martin Marklin sing to his bees. And I started to imagine just how many beautiful and splendid candles there will be to light up his funeral many years from now. I didn't tell him that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> People usually don't like knowing that you're imagining their funeral. <laughs> but if you met him, I think you would agree with me. Somehow, I actually, I actually don't think he would have minded. And so I was thinking about Tabitha and watching Martin sing to his bees, and, and then it made me wonder, what will I do? Or what will I make? Or what love will I share? Or what story will I tell that will touch so many lives that at my end, something will go on, at least for a moment, like a little ripple that, to me, is the most profound type of resurrection miracle there is, when death cannot stop the beauty of love or the impact of service, when death cannot cut off our memory and the way that it shapes us. And despite my two examples, it's not just craftspeople or those with spiritual connections to bees or the people who sow for the poor day and night, each one of us is called to some vocation that will be a part of making the world a little kinder and a little more filled with love. Some do it in their work. Some do it when they get home. Some do it on the weekends. Some do it in retirement. For some, it is generous giving. For others, it's the simple things about the way they parent. Some people cook food that seems to heal souls. Some people march in the streets and raise their voices. Some people make music that lifts our spirits. Some people care for family and neighbors. And yes, some people make candles and some people sow. Each one of us is called by God to some vocation that will be a part of making the world a little kinder and a little more filled with love. 
even if it's not the thing that you do all day, even if it's just the way that you hug a family member, or the way you stop to really listen to a coworker, or the diligence with which you carefully study for the sake of those that you will serve in the future. Each of these little moments is a chance for us to do something beautiful for the love of others and for the sake of God. And I think that people like Tabitha, people like Martin Marklin, I think they're the ones who really change the world. And they don't get top billing in the history books and plenty of people might never notice them. But they do something, something simple, and they do it beautifully well, and people remember. And then they live beyond themselves, even for just a moment. I really believe that all God needs to save the world is a few lives like those. All God needs to save the world are a few lives lived like that. A few people who do something simple, something beautiful, they do it for the sake of others and for the sake of God. All God needs are a few lives like those. And I pray that ours might be among them. Amen. Yours, it's very tough.